Alors, sans plus tarder, M. Denis, marchez le dos. Bon matin à tous. Um... Denis Marchildon de SAS, c'est nous qui commanditions le, comment, faisons le commandite pour le passage du train ce matin. Ah, c'est avec grande fierté que SAS s'est associé au rendez-vous CMO Les Affaires. Ah, pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas SAS, l'analytique avancée est au cœur de notre métier. Nous travaillons avec les CMO de tous horizons. Ah, il est fascinant de voir le rôle de ces technologies dans la transformation de la fonction marketing, l'approche « know your customer », l'importance d'avoir une vue 360 degrés du client, euh, mettre euh, au défi l'équipe marketing de mieux connaître le comportement du client aujourd'hui et surtout de mieux prévoir son comportement futur pour ainsi pouvoir répondre aux attentes grandissantes d'une clientèle toujours plus exigeante et volatile. Uh, il me fait plaisir ce matin de vous présenter notre conférencier, M. Andrew Zimakis, CMO de Tangerine. Um, as Chief Marketing Officer at Tangerine Bank, formerly known as ING Direct, Andrew Zimakis is responsible for overseeing all aspects of marketing for the organization, including customer insights, customer experience, and marketing and corporate communications. Prior to joining Tangerine, Andrew was a partner at Level 5 Strategic Strategy Group and the Managing Director of Brand Finance Canada, collectively focused on helping clients grow their, their business by leveraging the power of their brands. He also has over 20 years of senior management experience at leading organizations in a range of industry sectors, including Procter & Gamble, Microsoft, AOL, and Travelex. Andrew is on the advisory board of the North American CMO Council and is a former co-chair of the Canadian Marketing Association Branding and Strategic Planning Council. He also sits on the Board of Governors for Junior Achievement of, of Central Ontario and is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Andrew holds a Bachelor of Commerce Marketing from the Sauter School of Business in, uh, at UBC and an MBA from the Schulich School of Business at York University. Let's give a warm welcome to Andrew Zimakis. En 1997, ING Direct a entrepris de simplifier vos opérations bancaires et de vous aider à épargner. Avec leur taux avantageux, aucun frais injuste et un service à la clientèle hors pair, ils ont changé la perception des gens de ce que peut être une banque. Et c'est l'heure d'un autre changement. Leur nom. Tangerine. Un nom différent pour une banque différente. Une qui continuera à vous aider à changer d'air bancaire. Merci, Denis, pour cette généreuse présentation. Je vous remercie de votre invitation uh, ici aujourd'hui. Uh, Montréal est si belle et je vais toujours visiter cette grande ville. My preferred method today would be to deliver, to deliver the speech entirely in French, um, but I understand why at this point you uh, might prefer I switch back to English, so I will. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, what an honor it is to be here this morning to kick things off. Uh, what a fantastic venue and what a well-organized event. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, also, um, as Denis mentioned, uh, who waited patiently for the train. That was the same train that woke me up at uh, 3.30 this morning and uh, it was validation that I wasn't losing my mind. There actually was a train there, so that was helpful too. It's exciting to be speaking to so many fellow uh, CMOs and peers today about one of the most important issues we've faced as marketers in more than a generation. Often when I speak, like many of you, I'm sure, I'm clear right off the bat about what I'm going to talk about. I list them one, two, and three. But I won't do that today because I have no list. I'm going to focus on one issue, and that's the emerging importance of the CMO CIO relationship and how critical it is to successfully market to the next generation of consumers who are demanding more from their brands. And of course, we can't have that conversation with talking about the evolution of the role of the CMO. By the way, you'll note that I call it the CMO-CIO relationship. I notice that some CIOs call it the CIO-CMO relationship. Some are even beginning to suggest it should be the CIMO, the Chief Information and Marketing Officer. Regardless of titles and acronyms, though, we can all agree on the importance of the issue. There is no escaping it. We know we're using more software and other technologies than ever before. 
and we're recruiting for that new breed we now refer to as marketing technologists. Ad Week predicts that soon marketers will spend 75% of our budgets on digital. The Harvard Business Review even argues that marketing is undergoing a renaissance. I like that. I've tried to persuade my family that I'm a renaissance man, but with very little success. Any renaissance means change, so I want to talk to you about the. Uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, where the work we do is headed. There's probably never been a more dynamic time to be a CMO. Many of us, myself included, love what's happening, but for some, it's like an earthquake, and the aftershocks just keep coming. We need to be aware of how quickly our role is changing and the enormous pressure to be prepared for that change. The skills required to be the future CMO are not the same skill sets that many of us came into our roles with. A growing number of marketing leaders are recognizing the different skills needed by the future CMO. A group of marketers, management consultants, and IT consultants have started a nonprofit movement and a, web a website I urge you to check out futurecmo.org. They've also got a LinkedIn page with some great discussion, uh, discussion areas about where the role of the CMO is heading. One of the insights came from a study of 3,000 CMOs by Ogilvy One in the form of a forecast into the day of the life of a CMO in 2016. It predicts we'll, ha we'll get out of bed every morning and begin our work day by looking at our customized dashboards to simplify and visualize data insights. That data and mobility technology will result in real-time decision-making, and that new kinds of marketing talent will emerge, including digital bloodhounds who can quickly sort through data to determine the digital body language of customers, marketing day traders who will think like investment day traders in terms of managing the best mix of marketing tools to yield the greatest return, and finally, content yentas who will specialize in marrying content with customer intent across a range of digital platforms. I love the evolution of the role of the CMO, as I said. I believe we need to be change agents. Some have even suggested that in the future, CMO might stand for change management operator. That may be true, but the reality is we need to be agile, we need to lead, we need to be relevant, we need to demonstrate that we provide value across all platforms. Perhaps the reason I love this evolution is that these are all fundamentals behind Tangerine's culture and approach. Where we are headed is perfectly suited to where that CMO-CIO relationship is headed. Agility is fundamental to Tangerine. We've long been leaders in online banking. We're committed to being relevant to our customers and we strive to provide simple solutions and value across all platforms. At Tangerine, we enjoy serving financially empowered consumers who embrace technology. We know they make up a very large and fast-growing segment of Canadian consumers. For Tangerine, these people are behind the growing importance of the CMO-CIO relationship. To varying degrees, they are rea reality for all of us as marketers today and we expect this to accelerate in the future. That's an advantage for Tangerine because we have never been a bricks and mortar bank. We've always served customers differently, first as a telephone bank, then as Canada's first online bank, and now as a mobile first bank. We believe customers should dictate to us how they want to interact with us. But before I get into that more deeply, I wanted to give you a quick overview of Tangerine. For the last 17 years, we've been known to Canadians as ING Direct. This past April, we became Tangerine following our acquisition by Scotiabank. We're the largest direct bank in Canada with over $30 billion in deposits and $5 billion in direct lending. We continue to provide great value to each and every one of our almost 2 million customers. We employ close to 1,000 people, which for a financial institution of our size is representative of the true efficiency at the core of our operations. At the core of our success is a simple and engaging customer experience driven by innovation. We, conti we continue to develop simple products and features, making it even easier for Canadians to help us with their uh, to, to um, uh, help them with their everyday banking needs. In 2010, we launched the first mobile banking app across all platforms, smartphones, and tablets. 
That same year, we launched the first no-fee checking account in Canada that actually pays interest. We were the first bank to launch a tax-free savings account, introducing it to the market even before the government program launched. In 2013, we were the first bank in Canada to introduce remote deposit capture, which we call check-in, enabling our clients to deposit a check simply by taking a picture of it with their mobile device, as you would have seen demonstrated by our guy in the video. And we recently became the first bank to announce that we'll be launching biometric technology, allowing our customers to use their fingerprint as an additional level of security. We also announced voice banking, which will allow clients to bank using verbal commands with their smartphones. They can ask questions like, what is my latest balance? Or execute commands such as pay my cable bill or transfer money to my savings account. So in other words, they can use natural language to do all of this. Like all of you, we spend a lot of time talking about empowered consumers and the role that digital plays. We don't believe empowered consumers want things to be more complicated as technology develops. They've got busy lives. They want simplicity and ease of use. They want a relevant, quick, successful, and easy to use experience before they move on to the next thing they need to do. It's part of what's made us a successful challenger brand. The New Yorker magazine published an article recently called Twilight of the Brands. They talked about why today's brands are so much more fragile and why challenger brands have grown. It made the case that in the pre-internet era, we relied more on familiar trusted brands like Heinz Ketchup or General Motors because all the information we had was either advertisements for their products or past experience with their products. As traditional marketers, we once thought of consumers almost as commodities. We used marketing to create customer perceptions that we hoped would be lasting. It was a top-down relationship that we controlled. That's been flipped upside down, as everyone in this room knows. Today, there's virtually no end to the information available to consumers about brands old and new, as well as social media commentary from other consumers about their, their experiences with those brands. Consultants McKinsey and Company call it the consumer decision journey and make the argument that the more we know about that journey, the more effectively we can serve our customers. We know that consumers today have more choices than ever before. They're willing to act on those choices more quickly because of the vastness of information available to them. Relevance to the individual consumer is at the very core of the issue. It's why we've witnessed the enormous success of companies like Amazon and Netflix. I want to talk more about Netflix in a few minutes. But first, my main point is that there's been a complete 180 degree flip in terms of what's required to be a successful, relevant marketer today. It's not top down anymore. Empowered consumers must be embraced from the bottom up. Those of us who embrace that reality and work with them in a unique and personalized way will prosper. There's some amazing new research in this area. IBM issued a report called Stepping Up to the Challenge, the Changing World of the CMO, based on speaking in person with over 4,000 top executives from more than 20 industries to find out how they're earning the loyalty of digitally savvy customers and citizens. One of the really notable conclusions is that when CMOs and CIOs work well and work closely together, the enterprise is 76% more likely to outperform in terms of revenues and profitability. Unfortunately, the news for us CMOs wasn't all good. Less than 20% of us have integrated our company's interactions with consumers across different channels, installed analytical programs to mine customer data, and created digitally enabled supply chains to respond rapidly to changes in customer demand. So there's much to do. There's much to do because we know that empowered consumers are demanding a different type of relationship with brands today. And for the most part, they don't feel they're getting that relationship. That point was driven home by a new report just issued by Edelman and Brandshare based on interviews with 15,000 consumers in 12 developing and developed countries across 11 different industries. It shows that 90% of consumers want a more meaningful and interactive relationship with brands they choose. But only one in six believe that brands deliver that relationship today. It showed that 70% of consumers feel brands are self-centered and focused on their own objectives, 
while only 30% felt that brands have demonstrated a sincere commitment to the relationship with their customers. Those numbers are critical to today's reality about the CMO-CIO relationship. We need to understand the ways the customers want to interact with us. There's a great example of this. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the award-winning TV show House of Cards, created by Netflix. Would you be surprised to learn that part of its success, and perhaps a big part of its success, is due to big data? The New York Times reported that Netflix analyzed a raft of consumer data at its fingertips when it created the program. What users search for and when? What time of day they stream TV shows and movies? How far into the program they paused or rewound or even fast forwarded? And of course, when they tried a program and rejected it. The article said Netflix had access to more than 30 million consumer decisions every day. That's a lot of data and it told them that House of Cards would be a hit with viewers. Those of you who've seen it would probably agree it's a great show. Maybe that's a coincidence, maybe not. It's also why, and those of you who have used Netflix have noticed this, they offer you TV shows and movies recommended for you. It's exactly this type of insight-driven consumer experience that we can all draw inspiration from. At Tangerine, we want our clients to have a customized experience that speaks to the way they prefer to bank with us. We want to know how they want to interact with us and when in order to create a simpler, more relevant technology that will make their financial lives better. Because even for Tangerine, as is the case for all of you, there's an awful lot of data out there, almost too much. I like an observation made recently by Nate Silver, the founder of the website 538.com, who said, quote, we're not that much smarter than we used to be, even though we have much more information, and that means the real skill now is learning how to pick out the useful information from all that noise. It's where CMOs and CIOs need to work more seamlessly together. At Tangerine, we already know that data, data tells us a lot about our target demographic. We refer to them as hyper-direct and direct-ready Canadians. So what do we mean when we say hyper-direct or direct-ready Canadians? Hyper-direct people fully embrace online banking and feel confident about banking with a branchless financial institution, while direct-ready people have some direct product experience but have not fully adopted branchless banking. With some coaching and experience, they could become hyper-direct consumers in the near future, though. We know that hyper-direct and direct-ready people are already buying or ready to buy one or more banking products from a bank that has no branches. They're about 12 million strong, and right now, only about 15% bank with us. So you can see the opportunity to grow is huge. And their numbers are expected to grow by about 150% over the next few years. That's significant for Tangerine because we know that our scalable model allows us to be best positioned to take advantage of this trend and to do that quickly. We also know that among these digital ready Canadians, there's a greater expectation for personalization. They increasingly want to be able to interact with a brand on their own terms. This aligns completely with what we've always believed in at Tangerine. We're consumer advocates. We want to empower our clients to take greater control of their finances and their financial lives, and do that in, in ways that are relevant and meaningful to them. At the root of money is emotion, so that relevance is absolutely critical. So where's all of this headed? As I pause for a drink. One thing we do know is that the marriage of data and marketing is here to stay. The marriage of technology and marketing is here to stay. CMOs like myself need to continue to work closely with their company CIOs. Consumers have more information and therefore execute more choices than ever before. As consumers demonstrate that agility, brands also need to be more agile and better understand consumer sentiment. There's never been a better opportunity for marketing to move into a new era, an era of more effective interactions with consumers, an era of consumers leading where relevant and useful marketing goes, and an era where as marketers, we have an opportunity to gain insights from data to really make people's lives better. 
We have an opportunity to anticipate consumer needs without being intrusive and build more interactive relationships with them. At Tangerine, that is what's so exciting about where we stand today. We've always been more about than just offering a financial utility to our clients. We want them to save their money. We want them to make their financial lives better and in turn their lives better. Now we also want to be their leading everyday direct bank. And to achieve that, we need to be simple and relevant, more so than ever before. We need to be truly authentic and transparent. And that's really what we're striving to do at Tangerine. And I know all of you, as marketers, share many of these same challenges. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Andrew, thank you very much for this uh, very insightful presentation. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of topics that uh, a number of people in the audience would like to sit down with you and explore at, at greater length. Uh, but we'll start with a Q&A session, and perhaps at the end, some people will uh, want to approach you more personally. Great. Uh, alors, on va procéder aux questions. Il y a des micros uh, de chaque côté. Je vous invite à vous avancer, vous nommer et, uh, et poser la question. Si vous êtes plus à l'aise à la poser en français, n'hésitez pas. On pourra la traduire et, uh, et voilà. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, Vincent Rast, d'une firme de services conseil, Trisotech, spécialisée dans l'amélioration la, des processus d'affaires. Euh, ma question sera en français. Excusez-moi. Euh, ce que j'aurais voulu savoir, c'est au moment de la crise financière de 2008, comment euh, Tangerine a fait face à, euh, au choc euh, que les populations et que le consommateur a eu face euh, à cette crise et à sa considération de l'industrie bancaire et de la finance et de savoir si vous avez adopté des stratégies particulières en matière de marketing supportées par les TI euh, pour euh, rassurer le client ou transformer votre image. Merci. I got about half of that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but for safety purposes, I'll, I'll let you translate. Very good. Thank so you. Um, the question uh, related to the uh, global financial crisis of 2008. Yes. And how um, Tangerine um, handled the shock for its customers through a marketing and IT strategy uh, in order to uh, ensure that the, the clients would feel still comfortable in this, in, in dealing with Tangerine. What a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, Wow, where to start on that? Um, I guess the, the first thing I should mention is uh, I joined Tangerine uh, not long after the financial crisis, and uh, it was a, a real um, interesting lesson for me in, in how to uh, manage a situation like that. And in fact, we applied many of the sa same principles uh, to when we then went through a strategic review um, a, a couple of years after that, because that introduced a different kind of uncertainty, but uncertainty nonetheless. And, and uh, so as it relates to the financial crisis, just for context, um, uh, obviously uh, large financial institutions from many countries were severely affected, and, and one of those was ING Group, which was our former owner, and uh, they in fact had to uh, um, take assistance from the Dutch government, um, as you may know, and uh, that, um, to some extent created questions and uncertainty um, for us here in Canada, uh, uh, operating as ING Direct. The, uh, uh, the, the main, I, I, I guess the other thing to add to that too is um, we've always um, had to deal with uh, a certain amount of um, sentiment around the fact that we were a foreign owned bank. Uh, that's no longer the case with Scotiabank. Um, so there were a number of principles that we had in place already in terms of, first of all, reinforcing that uh, although we were foreign controlled, uh, you know, fundamentally we complied with all rules and regulations within the Canadian market, obviously. CDIC insurance applied to us. Um, we had different sort of touchstones around trust and trustworthiness, which as you know is, is critical in financial services, that we would constantly try to reinforce. So essentially what it came down to uh, was dialing up 
uh, many of those areas that we tried to uh, reinforce um, and, and you know, through uh, a multi-channel approach, through um, being more um, focused on the prominence of those messages and maybe even putting aside um, other messaging that was more growth uh, oriented. So that was uh, certainly part of it, um, but I think it went well beyond that and I think that was actually the, um, the lesser part of it. Um, that, this coincided with the time also that we uh, had a new CEO coming on board and he was someone and is someone who really embraces um, transparency, really embraces an inside out brand and leverages social media um, to do that. Um, if if uh, anyone's not familiar with Peter Aceto, um, he, uh, uh, he does all of those things, and this was a critical time for him, I think, to uh, really help people understand um, who ING Direct was, how the financial crisis um, uh, tied to us, and in many ways really did not tie to us, and um, he was able to leverage social and leverage a dialogue uh, dir directly with our clients in order to do that. So it's a long uh, answer to your question, but hopefully you get a sense as to how we managed it. Thank you. We have a question here. Am I allowed to ask a question as a panelist? Yes. Okay, good. Andrew, um, those of us who work with millions of clients know that if you have a client coming to your website every day, sometimes twice a day, that's gold. And as a client of your bank, I know that your website and the entire construct of the relationship is simple in plain English. Do you want to move your money? Do you want to look at your money? So you have a parent in the other, but does anyone here work for the other banks? Anybody? I think there's some national folks here, isn't there? <laughs> I thought I saw that. I could be wrong. What I can't understand is why a bank like Scotia or Bank of Montreal, another one of my banks, has not changed the format of the place where everyone comes twice a day. It's still a spreadsheet, it's still arcane, it still uses financial language. I mean, you've got people coming twice a day. How come you're the only ones who've cracked that code and will ap approach with an interface that is client-centric? These banks have what we all crave, people coming twice a day to their site to use it. What is stopping Scotiabank from doing the same thing? That's a good question. I mean, I'd, I'd preface it by saying, and I would have said this prior to the Scotiabank acquisition, that I think the big banks overall have um, raised the bar on customer experience, but I think we can all attest to the fact that it's, it's not where we want it to be, and our experience isn't where we want it to be either. Um, m my perspective on, on that, though, is that there's a number of contributing factors to that. There's legacy systems. Um, there's a model that's much more complex than the model we have in terms of product breadth, in terms of um, silos within the organization that make a more unified, seamless experience m more of a channel, uh, sorry, more of a challenge. We don't have legacy systems. Uh, we have more of a, um, a, a, an open, uh, agile approach to development. All those things help, and, and we're able to look at this in, a, in more of a unified, uh, customer experience perspective. But I think, I think the big banks are going to get there and that's, gonna, that's going to be price of entry um, and, and uh, it's going to continue to evolve beyond there. And at, I talked a little bit about voice banking uh, initially. We're still largely dictating to consumers um, how to interact with us and I can see it evolving to the point where the consumer is really, really going to control that. Internet of Things, wearables, all these things will contribute to that uh, one day, and and uh, what you just described will be one element, but it'll be a price of price of entry element. Hi, hi, uh, Donald Bid from Cedrom. Um, you talked about the biggest challenge being one of the biggest challenge being finding insight and uh, I guess actionable information in that sea of data, but there may be just there's way too much of it. What, uh, in your uh, knowledge of the relationship between the CMO and the CIO, what are the most important strategies to, to face that challenge that comes out of the relationship between those two? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Donald. Um, great, great question. Um, I don't, uh, or nor does anyone, I think, have the complete answer to that, but from my perspective, um, it's, it's, it's not a tool constraint so much um, or a process constraint as it is 
uh, a constraint of not being aligned with your C CIO and the organization not having alignment around what questions we're asking, what we're trying to solve. And, and to me, that's, that's the first challenge we need to um, overcome. So, you know, how, how does our data mining and, and actionable insight um, driving process link up to the business challenges that we face? Um, and I would say we're on a journey to, to, to try to clarify that. We're not, we're not there either. Um, the reality is uh, our CIO, like, like uh, I'm sure um, CIOs in many organizations here, they have to concern themselves with a multitude of things, infrastructure and a number of, of other areas. This has become a more important focus area. L likewise, Denis talked about the, the breadth of, of my role, and I'm sure many people here have broader roles where they're concerning themselves with um, uh, a number of things that, that fill up a day, and I think getting clarity on what the business objectives are and how big data will actually address that um, is, is the thing that we need to pause and take more time on. And with everything moving as quickly as it is right now, that's, that's a huge challenge. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we uh, need to uh, start looking into the next uh, agenda item. Uh, there is, however, one last, perhaps, short question I'd like sure. to ask you before we uh, we step out, uh, uh, step off the uh, the stage. Uh, there's a number of people uh, in in this uh, very audience that are uh, marketers and have. Uh, uh, careers on the rise. You talked about the uh, skills of the CMO. What about the skills of the team composing uh, the CMO's organization? What kind of skill sets should they look into develop for their own, for their, for themselves, um, or look for when they're hiring? That's one of the critical issues we all face. Um, I talked a little bit about the types of roles that are, that are more um, orientated towards. Uh, data, data analytics, um, but I think more broadly than that, <clears throat> I guess my personal belief is, you know, if anything, um, br breadth of skill set is becoming more important, but I, I heard an analogy recently that made sense to me, which is it's, it's, it's a W-shaped um, sort of uh, profile that we need of people. We need them to be relatively broad, but in a select few areas, they've got to go deep uh, as well, and that's what I'm seeing on, on, on our team, particularly um, in a business like ours where marketing is is holistically focused, and um, we're we're agile, we're nimble, uh, otherwise known as short-staffed, and and uh, and we need people to to have breadth in in, in their roles, um, but as well they need to go uh, deeper in particular areas. So that's that's the sort of profile we're now. Uh, looking both to uh, recruit for uh, and to develop. Um, this is a, uh, a huge challenge, though. We, we, there's a lot of discussion about uh, engaging millennials, attracting millennials. Um, that applies to our business as well. It's something that we haven't figured out either, and it's, it's a learning process. It's also a learning process for me uh, uh, personally. I'd like to think about the fact that uh, I'm old enough, but not too old, to try to bridge the more traditional world of marketing with this new world that we're all in. But increasingly, I'm being told I'm too old for that. So <laughs> that would make me very old as well. So <laughs> I don't subscribe to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.